those of you who may not have been able to hear that, the question is about fish feeding and coral feeding. And what, what do I recommend? Um, I recommend feeding the tanks. <laughs> so no starving of aquariums. Uh, and with regard to fishes, I, I strongly believe that the more food that you give them, the greater their resistance to disease. That's one of the best ways of dealing with uh, some of the common diseases uh, when they occur in a reef aquarium where you can't treat the fish. Um, there are plenty of exceptions to that. I mean, flukes are not going to go away just by feeding the fish. Uh, Odinian can be very, very difficult to deal with. But cryptocarrion, uh, slight uh, infections, um, uh, lymphocystis, you know, strong uh, or heavy feeding, maintaining a good diet, that can really just cure them up without any uh, chemotherapeutic uh, treatment. Um, what feeds? Uh, I recommend using all types of feeds, be they pellets, flakes, frozen, live. Mix it up all the time. Mix it up. I use all of it. All the time. Like, uh, well, like not necessarily like every day. You okay. might go, you know, a few days one, a few days another. That's how I do it. Drift from one to the other. Yeah. I might have two or three types of food on a given feeding, but then I might have only one type of food. And, uh, and it depends on how much time I have. Mix it right when up. I have no time, I just quickly grab the jar of pellets and just throw it. Sure. You know, and, that's, yeah. and what about coral feeding? Um, yeah, let me shut this down. Uh, uh, coral feeding, I, I also recommend. And there's several different types of foods that you do for corals. Uh, we talked about the different sizes for the different corals. So, you, you have to tailor it right. Um, some of the larger polyp stony corals, they're going to eat pretty good chunks of meat, whether they be uh, mice, shrimp, or... Um, and those are pretty know, much taken care by fish food. Uh, they are, but you can also target feed them. Um, some of the LPS corals, uh, you, you're going to get better growth, better expansion of polyps if you um, target feed uh, you know, individual chunks of food to them. And target feeding is it's only necessary maybe once a week, and that doesn't have to be every day. Um, you know, your bubble corals, um, Cinerina, they really appreciate that. And once a week little Chunk. nugget. Chunk. <laughs> um, the liquid foods, uh, you have phytoplankton and zooplankton, both are beneficial, although some literature will tell you that stony corals don't eat phytoplankton. That's not really true. Uh, they also eat um, uh, you know, the zooplankton that is going to feed on the phytoplankton that you add to the aquarium. So, you so, so just going back to your 3x2x2, two by two, for example, yeah. what sort of volumes and what sort of, uh, say the thing's full of corals right. and half a dozen fish, yeah. your normal aquarium model, what, what sort of uh, volumes and frequencies? Kind of hard, to, it depends which you're using. Um, well, let me ask this question. Yeah. Do you monitor how much you feed it? feed the tank by, by looking at your nitrate levels, for example? Um, you could, but if you've got uh, you know, a sand bed, um, it's not a guarantee, but if you've got a good sand bed with the biological nitrification, denitrification... Or, or a refugium. Or a refugium, you may be running quite low nitrate levels, and so you might not see it. Um, I. So you wouldn't use I a just nitrate add level yeah. as an indication of whether you're feeding them enough? No. I really look at the animals to give me that answer. Uh -huh. Now, if the nitrate seems to be increasing, then I would say, well, there's something inadequate about my biological filtration, and I would try to fix that rather than reduce the food. Um, some, you know, there, there are some frozen phytoplankton and zooplankton out there. Um, and I, I like to, they may come in little ice cube trays, I don't know if you have them we here. Get this. We get yeah, this. Yeah, and so on a given tank, like, like the one you described, I might, you know, once or twice a day, put two or three of those cubes in there. Really? Um, and I'm more like one, one cube once or twice a week. See, yeah, big difference. Yeah. Um, and I might do it more toward the evening when the, the corals are ready to, you know, put their polyps out. Uh, it, it has a good effect on their growth and their expansion. And, and that's you, true even with the SPS. Would is. you turn your water flow off when you did that? No, I keep it circulating. Okay, so yeah. you feed the whole thing? 
That's right. Both for Fuji and Andy. That's correct. Because yeah. quite often I turned them off when I was feeding fine food, just so that, so there's a dwell time for it to you know, just yeah. be moving around. Well, the you region. might you might consider turning off the water that goes over the overflow and yeah, just have in I mean. tank circulation because yeah. for many of them to feed, they need that movement of the water sure. to feed properly. Oh, yeah. Um, I hesitate to recommend people turning their filters off because, you know, if anybody's forget like me and they're busy, you can forget. Um, but, you know, then you run into oxygen problems. Uh, Someone should design a switch that allows us just to hit a button. It, ex it exists. Tunzi has that. Yeah? Yeah. It's called a food timer. Oh, yeah, that good. exists. Um, but then, of course, it could break. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you try to be practical on it. Um, let me see. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I gave you an indication based on how often. I, I try to feed yeah, they, the corals on a daily basis. You know, target feeding, you know, as well. And if you, if you had, say, say, say that same tank with half a dozen, um, uh, uh, say, tanks that are feeding yeah. off the rock anyway, uh, would you necessarily feed them all the time, every day? Um, I try to, but it's not absolutely necessary. If the tank is brightly illuminated and there is some filamentous stuff growing on the rocks, the tanks are going to get something on a daily basis. But I, I try to feed every day. Um, so, yeah. uh, when I'm away, times like this, um, the tanks tend to go longer periods without food. I tell my wife to, you know, remember to put some food in. I don't know whether she does. And, and when we both leave, the tanks are on their own. I have on occasion set up automatic feeders. They don't always work. And um, in my experience, being away 10 days without feeding them doesn't cause a problem. So the fact that I normally feed every day doesn't mean that you have to feed every day. You know, it's, it's OK. Relax. Um, and so I do go periods of time where I'm away a week, 10 days or more, and, and no feeding at all. And, and do you still promote the, uh, the regular water change? I know there's yeah. been some... I, I've done experiments with long periods without water change, and then, of course, with water change. And I, I think that the simplest, both simplest from a maintenance point of view, and uh, you know, for how, how much work is involved, and then for just uh, keeping the quality of the water up, it, is the old rule of thumb, you know, 10, you know, 5, 10%, 15% per month. Uh, depending on the size of your tank. Yeah. If your tank is really big, it can be a big chore to change 10% a month. Uh, if it's small, it can be no, no big deal. Um, but that's all I recommend. I don't recommend that you change the water every day or every week. Some people do. Um, you know, just fit it into your schedule. Mark it on the calendar and do it once a month, or you know, it can go every couple of months. And, okay. and Chemical additives. I mean, I generally just go with cow He's the only one with questions, you know that. But he's got all well, of them. I hope I'm questions. asking good questions. So. <laughs> they're all have great. Like, have a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, they're all well, great. Well, what about you know, like I, I'm a lazy man. I look after aquariums for a living, so that's why I've got a few good questions, I suppose. But um, I, I like the idea of cow fossa Yeah. And 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 maybe some magnesium, maybe a drop of iodine every now and then. That's about it. Yeah. Um, uh, you uh, mentioned magnesium. Ma yeah, iron and manganese. Manganese. Yeah. Depending on how much you feed the tank, you can get iron and manganese from the food. Um, but from the food or the yes. replacement water? Uh, no, the replacement with water is, is is not a way of supplementing. Okay. Um, so uh, you know that I wouldn't count on that. Uh, but the food can supply it, uh, and then also there are supplements which you can use. All right, my, my, my last uh, question. I, I didn't really answer you there, but I, I, yeah. I, I agree with you on the call glosser. Uh, yes. I use it on all, all my equipment. So you don't get calcium reactors and CO2 and well, all Well, you can, uh, especially. Okay. I mean, if you're, if you're yeah. you guys say chock a block here, right? Yeah. If you're full of, of acropora, you yeah. know, like this Go guy I saw in, in Baltimore area when I, when I was in Baltimore. Um, he had a big calcium reactor, and that wouldn't have worked without it. Yeah. The, the amount of SPS corals in there was intense. Okay. And you'd be hard-pressed to meet their demands for calcium and alkalinity without a calcium reactor. So, yeah, but I, found typical, it, I found initially using yeah. calcium I had some problems 
the pH going up too much. Well, you were you were adding too much during the day. Yes. Yeah. Well, I was trying to set it up so it was automatic through a replacement process. Yeah. The 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 way you do that, if you look at our jar in the Two Little Fishies uh, Kalkwasser, we have a, a recipe, and it's um, a quarter of a teaspoon. You do use teaspoons here, right? Yeah. yeah. A quarter of a teaspoon per 50 gallons uh, per hour. Okay. So. If you were adding it by hand, and you had a 50-gallon tank, you could have whatever volume of fresh water you want to add, whether it's a cup or a pint or whatever, quarter of a teaspoon, shake it up like that. You could pour that into a 50-gallon tank. You don't need to drip it. You don't need to settle it. Bam, right in there, and the pH is going to be okay. But don't add it again for another hour. An hour later, you could do it again. Okay, so if you had absolutely nothing else to do in your entire life, you could do your own <laughs> Kalkwasser doser, and that would work. Yeah. Um, nobody has devised a, a dosing system that can properly get that quantity of the powder in, in okay? But when you're dosing Kalkwasser, if you would keep that volume, that amount in mind, uh, when you're adding so many teaspoons to something and know that the dripping system is adding so much volume per hour if it's properly mixed, hey, maybe I'm exceeding that amount. That's, that was the reason for coming up with that recipe. Yeah, and, and it was achieved by the very difficult technological uh, way of trial and error. <laughs> I, I tested it. Now, it, it's a fairly loose number. You could also add a quarter teaspoon to 40 gallons or to 60 gallons, <laughs> you know. And you could add a little bit less than a quarter teaspoon to 30 gallons. Well, uh, I, it's, I, it's rough. Yeah. It's a rough number. It's not absolutely yeah. hard and fast. In my experience, uh, the, the demand for it goes up as yeah. the, the mature. That's correct. Matures. Demand for calcium and alkalinity goes up. It's not like you can set your uh, steering wheel hold it and you're going on a straight road. What happens is you set your steering wheel and it looks straight but it starts to curve a little bit and you run off the road because that curve is the change in demand. That's my analogy for it. And just thinking on calcosser and calcium for a minute, the yeah. KH levels when you're using calcosser, generally you don't use starting bocub to kick it up at all. Right. But I find that my levels change between 7.85, 7.9 up to 8.2. Uh, in a day. And I'm Your pH. Yeah. Right. right, that's normal. Photosynthesis is the reason for that. Yeah. Photosynthesis and respiration. The amount of uh, CO2 consumption due to pho photosynthesis and the amount of CO2 production due to respiration, there's a balance. Yeah. And this is the reason for the refugia on a reverse daylight cycle. You try to um, temper that, that shift that occurs from day to night. So you still recommend having those in reverse cycle? Uh, yes, it's a good way to stabilize pH. Because a lot of people talk about having their effusion lights running 724 so the colorpa doesn't go through. We use more electricity and, and don't really have any great advantage. Yeah. I'm glad so I asked. Reverse daylight is fine. And moving on a bit, um, UV versus ozone. I, I've been playing oh, was, with... was a question where... Somebody else was asking me that. I've been playing with ozone and I love the stuff. And I'm yeah. just wondering how, what you're thinking. I've sort of stopped using UV and gone with ozone right. more, more so. Well, the truth is you don't need either of them on the aquarium, but they have advantages, both yeah. do. The UV is, is really, the main benefit is the fishes. To some extent, you know, there's been, you know, a little banter over the years about dealing with RTN, repetition, necrosis, other bacteria diseases that UV sterilizers might help corals in a reef aquarium. Nobody's proven it. It's pure superstition. It's probably true, but it's not proven. Uh, fish diseases, it's fairly well proven, but you've got, got to remember that an ultraviolet sterilizer is not a guarantee. It's nothing like quarantine. It's not a way of absolutely curing a disease, but it will for sure reduce the incidence. And so like for any systems like this, store aquariums where you're constantly bringing in new fish, uh, you'd be crazy not to have a UV sterilizer on, on the system. So um, in home aquariums, they can be used or, or avoided. Uh, it, it's, uh, everyone has their own preference. Ozone is very, very useful. A little bit risky. You know, you, you 
have the potential if, if the ozonizer is set too high uh, to you know, over oxidize the aquarium. You need to be able to off gas the ozone or filter it through carbon. Uh, go ahead. Uh, I've, I've been playing with it for a while now because I was, I was always shy of spending the money on redox meters and so on yes. and so forth uh, until I read a, a, a book on it. I couldn't tell you which one it is. But very good book, I feel. Yeah. And he said, uh, look, just use a small ozone, right. run it for, for, for four or six or eight hours a day, yeah. run it at quarter speed, Very low see level. what effects you get. And, and, and I've got to say that it solved lots of problems in lots of tanks Absolutely. that I had in terms of uh, clarity of water, what, yeah. general healthy looking thing, uh, right. you know, and to me it was a bit of a panacea. Uh, and, yes. and I've used it that way always. So I still run it in, I've now got- You got uh, it in the skimmer? Yes, right. yes, and I've now got it, you know, running with a meter just to sort of uh, hone my skills, if you like. Right. But I, I certainly have found that if you use an undersized ozone, use it for a few hours, do it at night so that you never smell the ozone. Right. And that's worked really, really well for me. Yes. Um, just, yeah. I know in your books, your early books, you mentioned the dangers of using it and so on and so forth. I'm just right. wondering whether there's been more, there seems to be more people using ozone. Well, I, I believe that your, your approach is the correct one, um, to, to go with the minimum amount. And it, it's effective, you know, because the oxidation of the organics in the water will, you know, improve the clarity, which improves the light penetration and makes all the animals all very, very happy. And it has some antibacterial anti-pathogen effects as well, just like a UV sterilizer. So, um, as I said, it's one of those pieces of equipment that I don't consider essential, but it is useful. Yeah. And if used correctly, it's very useful. Used incorrectly, it can produce tragedy. Uh, but, you know, you, you're, you've got the right approach. Well, the other thing is just to observe, make sure, you know, what I do is the outflow of the protein skim is going back into where my refugium is. Right. And I've got stuff living around the, out, the outside yeah. of it. So uh, if I burn anything, I've only ever really, I put one acro that was got too close to it and burn it. And I thought, oh, well, that's interesting. But it was only like, you know, within 30 centimeters of the opening of it. Right. Anything beyond that, totally fine. So. Yes. Um, that sort of tells me that the ozone breaks down pretty damn quickly. Yeah, it, it off gases it, it combines with organic molecules rather quickly. Yeah. yeah. And then I sort of relegated the UV to be kicked into play if I ever had disease in fish. Mm -hmm. Right. And it helps. Yeah. And it definitely helps. Well, I've had it. Is that five minutes? <laughs> okay. Now, any other questions? You had questions outside. Um, you have to share. Uh, what would be your sort of standard mythology uh, for you know, the setup of a small reef like 4 by 2 by 2 Mythology. <laughs> I give you a hard time. Um, this is a reef aquarium, 3 by 2 by 2 or 4 by 2 by 2? And And what specifically do you want to know about filtration, about... Filtration and circulation. Right. Um, yeah. you've got sort of space, but you want to make right. Okay. I, I do recommend uh, having an overflow in a sump. Uh, I've set up lots of aquariums without them that work just fine, but they are limited as far as holding capacity with regard to fishes, uh, because aquariums without sumps run lower oxygen levels at night. It's just a given. That water going over the overflow is very effective in keeping the, the oxygen level up. Uh, so that basic design of display aquarium and sump is what I would recommend. Um, doesn't mean you can't do it the other way, but I would recommend that. Now, what would go in the sump? Um, you need, of course, to size the sump correctly to handle the drain down. That's, that's just general engineering. Um, but I, I do like having a uh, refugium with uh, al algae, especially the ketomorpha that I showed you that apparently is not widely available, but calorpha is a good alternative. Um, I do tend to have areas in the refugium where I end up putting some corals <laughs> because there's always some place that you need to put something and 
and for some reason you can't have it in the display tag. Yeah. No. Yeah. I do reverse daylight. Yeah. yeah. pH and oxygen, both being balanced that way. Um, look, I'm not saying you can't be successful with 24 hours. I just don't think it's necessary. Um, and so, you know, that's my opinion. All right. Um, uh, that is the cycle of life. <laughs> that's what they do. Um, I, I'm not really sure that anyone has absolutely proven that a 24-hour day length is going to prevent that. Um, I know it's been written and said, but I'm not convinced that, that it's even true. Uh, you can select strains of Calerpa that, I, I mean, I don't know if you've ever noticed, if you collect your own Calerpa, somewhere down the line, whether it's one week, a month, two months, three months of growth, you're going to get that sexual thing happen. But not all of it dies. You'll find a little strand here and there, or a blade, that doesn't go sexual. And those, if you take those pieces and then plant them in a refugium and culture, they almost never go sexual. So it's a, a selection that you can do. And then you have a, a growing strain that's really good as a filter. Uh, why does that happen? It's a strategy for the alga. Um, simple growth with their runners and rhizomes is a form of reproduction because those runners get torn by the waves, they settle somewhere else and grow. But when they go sexual, they're, they're putting gametes into the water or spores. They have something that's called alternation of generations. Sometimes the plant is putting male and female gametes, which then you know, combine and form new uh, plants that settle elsewhere. Sometimes it's literally a spore, an asexual reproduction of a, a, a particle of the chloroplast that gets in the water, and then that settles and then continues to grow. But it's, it's a strategy that the Calerpa has three ways, really, of, of reproducing that way. And why they do it? Because it works. <laughs> uh, so I mentioned about the bacteria in the aquarium. Why, you know, why do they do what they do? It's not to filter the water, it's to live. Same thing with the Calerpa. And we can take advantage of those bacteria the same way we can take advantage of the Calerpa is select those blades or, or runners that don't go sexual, and then you cultivate them, and they are uh, ideal for your filters. Yeah. And then I explained to him that his new aquarium was shaped differently. He had the problem that I showed in that tall aquarium from Monaco. His new aquarium was really, really tall and fairly narrow, and he had improper reflectors for it, and the light was super directional. So I said, okay, over there, and over there, and over there, you could keep corals. Everywhere else in your tank, forget it. <laughs> um, and he had places where the light was just way, way too hot, too bright, and most other places, it was there were shadows. I said, come back here, just stand back here and look at your tank. Do you see what I'm seeing? Look at all these dark spots over here, it's all shadows. And that was because of the geometry, the way the reflectors worked, and they were throwing beams of light in some places and just lots of shadows everywhere else. And I said, you know, there's just not enough light here. You've got to move this coral over here. And if you put it here, just a few inches away, it's going to get burned over there. I said, don't you see that? And so he said, well, what do you recommend? And then, and then I turned him over to a friend of mine, Sanjay Joshi. You've probably seen his name on the forums. And he's a lighting expert, has done lots of exper <coughs> excuse me, experiments with different bulbs and ballast combinations and reflector combinations. And he's got all the data. I don't. Uh, if I need to find out some, something for uh, a given tank, I just say, hey, Sanjay, what would you recommend? Here are the dimensions. And, and he comes up with a good recipe. And he, he did that for this guy, and it improved the, the tank. But it, you know, it's, it's surprising to me how oftentimes aquarists will do aquariums by the numbers. They'll say, well, my tank is this size, so I need this many gallons an hour and that many wattage. But it's so important to look at the tank and, and see, is the water moving? Is the light spread evenly? Uh, that makes a big, big difference. It can make or break an aquarium. Um, so, other question? Yeah? What do you think the merits are of the two-part basin system? Yeah. I've got a tank set up there. Large and soft Okay, when was this put here for me? 
Oh, right at the beginning? Give me a moment. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, just thinking about that, there's a lot of people that on the um, brief central or the Randy's yeah. two part system is. You never see anybody system. talk about Julian's two part system. C balance. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Let's talk about that one. Too. Yeah, right. No, I was it, it, using just normal household yeah. stuff around right. alkalinity and the calcium supplementation rather than using the calcium and after all. Yeah. Here, here's the deal on that. Um, Kalkwasser is the, the cheapest route of achieving that. Kalkwasser, it, it supplies calcium and alkalinity. Um, Two-part dosing systems is a bit more expensive. So you have a cost factor. Um, however, the two-part dosing systems are by far easier and safer than Kalkwasser. I mean, easier is maybe a relative thing. When I say easier, Kalkwasser has to be dosed. You have to really pay attention carefully because if you overdose it, the pH goes too high. Yeah. Um, you do have to dose the two parts, but it's pretty easy. You follow the instructions. You add equal amounts of part A and B, and, and you know you can do it maybe once a week, twice a week, three times, depending on how much coral you have and how they're growing. Um, it, it's a little bit less involved on the you know thinking wise, yeah. um, but as I said, it's more expensive. Um, calcium reactors require a, a lot more money, a lot more capital investment to get them going. Uh, they're technologically a little bit more complex, but once you have them set up, if it's a good calcium reactor, it doesn't require a whole lot of maintenance. And so for the, you know, the high-end Aquarius, most of them end up gravitating toward a, cal a calcium reactor. Um, but there's a whole lot of middle ground there where people use the two-part supplements and, and it works really well. Uh, the Kalkwasser is limited by how much water you can add to the aquarium. You dissolve the, the calcium hydroxide in fresh water. If your evaporation rate isn't very high, you're limited. You can't add more Kalkwasser. Um, two-part solution doesn't have that limitation. Uh, also, calcium hydroxide is not very soluble. So you can only get so much calcium in the water when you're dosing calcium hydroxide. And if your evaporation rate is low, you, you just you can't keep up with the demand of the corals. That's where the two part comes in. And you can add all you need, no problem. So that's so. why you see people using two part and adding calcium. That's right. They do, they top off their evaporation with calcwasser and they add two part maybe once a week, every so often, to make up for the difference where the calcwasser is inadequate. Um, lots of people doing that. Yeah. And with the auto top up, um, with the top up, sorry, do you yeah. use auto top up for evaporation? Say again? Do you use um, auto top up systems for evaporation? I, I have m many aquariums set up that way, but not all of them set up that way. Um, what I want to say about it, though, uh, you have to be careful in how you set it up. Uh, auto top up systems are not foolproof. Um, snails get into sumps, they cr climb on level switches, that causes... <laughs> you don't want to put snails and hermit crabs in your sump if you have an automatic top-off system. It's easy to forget that. <laughs> um, That's why I asked. I was wondering yeah. how foolproof they are. Uh, you know, where they, they're not absolutely foolproof, but there are ones that are designed with safety devices in them, and I, and I consider them to be you know, in the 90 percentile range of foolproof. So, you know, that means that before you go on a chip, trip, make sure there isn't a uh, calcareous worm growing <laughs> somewhere where it could, you know, jam up the, the float. Uh, check them periodically. Um, there, another way of, of dealing with it, and it's my preferred way, and it's what I, I do, is to use a dosing pump without a level switch. Um, and there are variable speed dosing pumps. Peristaltic. Peristaltic, okay. Downside on those is that the hose for the peristaltic pump does wear out. And if you get lazy and don't remember to change it, it can split and then the thing can leak and you know, there can be problems there. Um, but as far as safety, that's one of the safest ways to top off. But see, if your tank's in equilibrium, the rate of evaporation should be pretty 
constant? Yes. Well, it's not absolutely constant because it really depends on the humidity in the, in the house. Right. And that can vary somewhat. But it's relatively constant. Yeah. And you can make it up, you know, you just watch the level on the sump. If it seems like you're, you're losing a little bit more, you can adjust as needed. Um, you can also top it. If it seems you're running short, you could just do a one-time quick top off and, yeah. and let, it, you know, let it continue on its way. If it seems like you're overdosing it and over compensating, you turn back the, the flow range or cut the, the period of time. I, I like to use um, dosing pumps with caulk wasser and have them dose at night when the pH is naturally a little bit lower. Uh, so I'll, I'll set them on a timer so that it, it's dosing maybe over a period of eight hours in the night. Have it come on for a period, of, either for a half hour at a time, or maybe it depends on what kind of timer you're using. If it's a programmable timer, you can do whatever you want. If it's one of those lamp timers that has half hour on off switches, you know, just have it come on a half hour off a half hour over an eight hour period, you, you'll be good. And that's the account? For cough loss. Yeah. yeah. So you're topping off and dosing uh, the calcium hydroxide at the same time. You can do something similar with two-part solutions. Uh, there are two-channel peristaltic pumps. So they're dosing the same amount in each channel, and you can connect it to two separate reservoirs. And those can be freshwater reservoirs, and you can put a certain amount of part A and part B separately each, and then, then it's automatic uh, two-part solution addition. It's, it's possible. Yeah. Other questions? One over there. What's the best form of surface agitation moving the surface to the tank? Best form of surface agitation? Um, well, one of the easiest ways is to put a fan right on the surface. You know, and there are commercially available ones that you can hang on the back of the aquarium. Um, but you know, pardon me, I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> Get that on the table. Um, you know, water circulation with a pump, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, with an adductor or um, uh, a prop type pump, that's going to give you good surface agitation. Uh, there was something that was occurring to me. Uh, basically, the a wide open, as wide open a, a, an outlet uh, on, on a water stream is going to give you a broader ripple effect. Uh, of course, in a localized area, if you have a compressed where you take the end of the pipe and press it flat, you're going to get agitation right there, but it's not going to translate to the whole tank. Uh, having a stronger stream out of a wide opening is going to affect the, the whole body of water better. There's also um, uh, wave makers. Yeah. Uh, what was the name of that company? They no longer make it. Uh, but there was one that made like a panel wave maker. And that, that created a little chomp on the tank. And that, that uh, is very effective for gas exchange because, you know, if you were to measure how that affects the surface, you know, when the tank is flat, it's just length, length time width, you know. But then, once you've got chop, you have all of that extra surface, which really improves gas exchange tremendously. Uh, so those are the main ways. Uh, wind, <laughs> open stream, or chop. Yeah. Uh, of course, the old days, we used air stones and air bubbles. Uh, large, flat air bubbles can create quite a bit of surface agitation. Uh, so. You know, that, that would be another category. They also create salt spray and it's a mess. Any other questions? I've got another one if that's all right. Go ahead. Um, apart from all the sand equipment that you've got, yeah. you know, your lighting, your skimmering, your sun, your refugium, and your, um, your intake circulation, once yeah. you've got that all sorted, mm -hmm. what extra toys do you think are the most beneficial? So after you've got all the basics, yeah. if you wanted to buy extra toys, what do you think is the... Techno <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking about the, the budget side of things as right. opposed to how can they be for your tank. Okay. Toys are inconvenient. Let me put it that way. If the toys are involved in any way with the maintenance, 
then they are more likely to make you get out of the hobby than stay in it. Yeah, I'm Okay. Well, as we talked about the automatic top-off systems, yep. there are risks involved. Yep. And so the, the most toys add an element of risk. Yep. <laughs> if they involve plumbing, if they involve control, if they fail, you're going to have a problem. Yep. And that problem could be water on the floor, it could be dead fish, it could be you know, any number of things. So bear that in mind. Um, However, this hobby is in part about keeping and enjoying the animals, and it's also, let's, let's face it, it's cool. Uh, and there are people for whom the technological side of the hobby is the real attraction. You know, that's a cool filter. Wow, what a lighting system. Oh, look at that computer controller you have. You know, it's, you know, it's part of it for some of us. You know, it's it's like the difference between the, you know driving a Ferrari or, or a common car. Yeah. Is that you don't actually need them. Right. Yeah. And yeah. that is true. You know, you can do it with the simplest, simplest setup, and uh, that doesn't mean that the simplest setup is the very best, but um, it's pretty close to it. <laughs> um, some technology is a good thing, but too much is is a bad thing. You, know, you want to keep it in balance. Um, there are uses for computer controllers, but but it's not something that a new hobbyist should consider, even if they like the idea. Uh, other toys, uh, you know, we talked about wave makers. You know, wave makers are not essential, but I consider them a, a nifty little device, uh, and they allow you to create. A, uh, a type of a habitat where you have surge, uh, that that can be a useful toy. They're not foolproof, they break down, they're expensive, but when they're running, there is a wow factor. Um, let me see, what else? Uh, I mentioned dimmers. Um, I, yeah, I, uh, I haven't seen, I don't think you have them here, uh, and I haven't seen them widely popularized in the USA, but in Germany, there were these uh, great little computer controlling systems for dimming T5 lights. Do you have those here? No? Very cool. Uh, um, when you see an aquarium brightly illuminated a reef tank, and then it just looks like a cloud passed over as it, as it dims, and then comes up again, you can feel it in your body. It, it's, the, it's the most stunning effect. Whenever, if you go outside and you're out on the beach and you're in your trunks and you know, your back is bare and a cloud pass over and you feel that little chill and all, you feel that when you're watching the aquarium. It's the strangest thing. Um, it's, you know, there is something to it and it's cool. Is it necessary? No. But it's cool. <laughs> so, um, other things. Hmm. Yeah. Right. Well, they they have you know real benefits. Uh, so and that, that's not that's not a cool or a wow factor. There's biological. There's things you can observe. You know, water clarity and and, uh, and the response of the animals to it. So uh, yeah. You know I didn't mention in, in your question of what I would put on the tank. Um, a little bit self-serving, but I, I recommend Fosban, the Fosban reactor. It's um, great if you're keeping a lot of fish and you're feeding them. Phosphate is an issue for corals, and that's a way to keep that under control. So that's sort of a, an accessory piece of equipment um, that makes a big expensive. difference. What? They're not so expensive. No, not too bad. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. A negative impact on what? Not in my experience, no. Um, I, I think probably the the implication is that zoanthids, not zoanthids, uh, um, live in sort of dirty water, uh, and that's true and it's not true. You can find them in dirty water and you can find them in clean water. Um, I have not seen phosphate limitation uh, affect the growth of zoanthids, so I'm not sure what 
you know, somebody may have observed. It's probably more coincidental. Um, zoanthids, uh, they, they need to be fed. You know, that's an important feature for them. Um, lighting is important for them. You, you know, if you don't get the lighting just right, they can bleach out or they just get ugly. The color doesn't hold very well. Um, there is some indication that you'll see on the um, on the forums referring to vitamin additions and, and zoanthids, and I believe there is some truth to that. Um, and that gets back to feeding. You know, I mean, adding foods, you're supplying vitamins. Uh, and some people have played around with, with vitamin supplements and noticed that the zoanthids improved. Uh, and I think that that probably is a valid observation. It needs to be studied a little bit more. Uh, but, you know, um, what else about them? Zoanthids also suffer from some parasites as well. There's little uh, nudibranchs and sea spiders that will attack them. So it's important to observe them carefully and dip, you know. Uh, do, is, is the zoanthid hobby big here? Uh, oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, the, the zoanthid hobby has just got out, gotten out of control in the USA. I mean, the more names you have, then the fewer polyps you need to sell. <laughs> you know, they get colonies that are sold by the polyp. Uh, are you doing that here or no? Yeah, and that is that is pretty nuts. <laughs> you know, you're going to have to start with a, a polyp, and it costs you fifty dollars. Yeah. Well, good for them if they can sell it, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, you can create really quite a simple reef aquarium that, that's stunning, beautiful, with just many different color forms of the zoanthids. And it can be a, you know, a small tank like that. So I, I, uh, I recommend that to beginning hobbyists, but they should stay away from those $290 pots. <laughs> you know. uh, okay. I see you staring at me, and that, that's a sign that it's time to finish. <laughs> well, anyway, I, I, on behalf of the Jessica Friends, I'd like to really thank you all, guys all for coming. Um, once again, we'd really love to thank Gillian for, um, for coming on.